Joining us now in the Element Well Studios, Aaron Rice, the director of the Mississippi Justice Institute. Aaron, always good to see you, my friend. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Gerard. So, we got so much going on, and and uh, with respect to this this Dobbs decision overturning Roe v. Wade, yeah, and it's just been a watershed mm-hmm. of activity, yeah, uh, in the courts, in the states, uh, protests on both sides, uh, celebration by the pro life camp, and and uh, good grief, the pro choice folks have really gone crazy, yeah, but. Here in Mississippi, like other states, some other states, red states in particular, we had what are called trigger laws, yeah. which is something I never even heard of, honestly, yeah. until this, this case. And essentially, if I, if I could set this up, that is a, a law that was enacted that is triggered yeah. that would go into effect based on some other event. It's yes. connected to some other event. In this case, the event was the decision on the Dobbs case. And I think what Mississippi's trigger law says is that abortion would be prohibited in the state. And there is uh, some time between, as specified in the law, some time period between the decision, in this case the decision handed down by the Supreme Court, and the effective date of the trigger law. Yep. The attorney general is responsible for certifying that mm-hmm. and then notifying any organization or I guess it could be anything, any person yeah. if a, a trigger law that could be in violation of existing law yeah. based on the effectiveness of the um, uh, the effect, I should say, of the trigger law. Here we are, and it goes into effect tomorrow. Yeah, it does. It does. And so the, the trigger law, I mean, it, it uh, prohibits abortion except for in cases of, of the life of the mother or rape. And so that's what okay. it was. But, you know, again, I mean, going back to the broader picture is just that, you know, state legislatures had had their ability to legislate on this issue taken away by the U.S. Supreme Court and the Roe decision and its progeny, Casey and all those. And so, yeah, what you had was state legislatures saying, look, we can't legislate on this, but we know that there are efforts to overturn those decisions. And so we're going to go ahead and say what we would do if we're allowed to do it or what we're going to do if we're allowed to do it. So in this case, the Mississippi's trigger law was passed, I believe, seven years ago or maybe right. more. Right. Um, and yeah, and it, and it wasn't passed because of Dobbs. Dobbs wasn't even being litigated at the time. It was just saying if Roe is ever overturned. And the reason the attorney general is responsible for certifying that is because, you know, if you had some opinion that came down from the U.S. Supreme Court that was maybe a little blurry, people didn't really know what, what exact effect it had, you wouldn't want to have laws going into effect. So you have the attorney general responsible. In this case, we had a very cl- clear ruling okay. in Dobbs, but the attorney general, Lynn Fitch, certifies and says, yes, uh, this decision has overturned Roe and Casey and his progeny, uh, and our trigger law would likely be upheld by the court. And so once that's certified, the, the trigger law goes into effect 10 days later. In this case, that's tomorrow. Uh, of course, we had the, the lawsuit from, you know, Jackson Women's Health Organization uh, that was trying to prevent that based on the Mississippi Constitution, and we can talk about that. Yeah. Um, but just yesterday, the special chancellor that was overseeing uh, that court challenge uh, basically declined to issue what's called a preliminary injunction, which would have prevented the trigger law from going into effect while that lawsuit is litigated. So because there's not going to be a preliminary injunction, these trigger laws will, in fact, go into effect tomorrow. So uh, Rob McDuff, yes. who's the longtime attorney representing uh, the Jackson Women's Health Organization, also known as the Pink House, yeah, uh, because that is the color li- literally of the building, of the structure. Yeah in which abortions are performed. Uh, And so he argued that the trigger law is in conflict with a 1998 ruling, right? right? Yeah. And and that was the basis. But the chancellor – so if I'm not mistaken, this this deal goes to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court appoints a chancellor. Yeah. I'm not exactly sure what that is. What the heck's a chancellor? A, a chancellor is just a, a type of judge who deals with equity lawsuits like this. Okay. And so it's not necessarily about civil uh, you know, damages. And so it's just the type of judge that deals with a case like this. Uh, so, But, yeah, in this case, um, we're dealing with the Mississippi Constitution. Um, the arguments here are, are perfectly fine arguments for, you know, the Pink House to be making, Rob McDuff to be making. He's a good sure. attorney. These are all uh, very valid arguments for them to be making. Um, it's just a kind of weird situation. And so if you back up, 
you know, a lot of people don't even realize that we have a Mississippi Constitution and that all 50 states have a Constitution. Sure. And so the way it works is that the federal Constitution really just sets the floor and its Bill of Rights sets the floor of these are the rights that have to be protected in the states. The 14th Amendment is what uh, incorporated those into the states, but says uh, this is the floor. But every state has the right, if it wants to, to have greater protection of rights set forth in its state constitution. And so it is not, you know, completely unfeasible that you could have a situation in which Roe is overturned, the federal government is saying, the Supreme Court is saying there's no federal right to an abortion, but then some state could be saying, aha, but under our state constitution there is. I got you. So what you've had is that back in 1998, this actually was litigated to the Mississippi Supreme Court. The Mississippi Supreme Court did, in fact, say there was a state constitutional right to an abortion. We can discuss where that supposedly was located in the Constitution. It was not specifically enumerated in the Constitution, of course, just like with Roe and the federal Constitution. But uh, that did happen in 1998. Now, what makes this interesting and, and kind of really a, a, a very much a legal gray area is that that Fordyce opinion, that, that's what the name of the case was, 1998 uh, Pro-Choice Mississippi versus Fordyce, it relied very heavily on the Roe decision. So it was basically comparing okay. Mississippi's constitution to the federal constitution and comparing what the Supreme Court did in Roe and basically saying, we're going to do the same thing here. You know, there wasn't a lot of exploration of what you would normally need to see to say this is a longstanding, you know, a history and tradition of a right in Mississippi. The court looked at a few things. You know, it looked at, uh, for example, the fact that abortion at the time of Mississippi's 1890 Constitution had been ratified, that that uh, that a, abortion was illegal, but not before quickening, which is when the fetus can move the baby and the womb can move. And so, um, so it basically looked at all that, but it, it, it really based it heavily on the Roe case. And so, what you had uh, Scott Stewart from the Attorney General's uh, office arguing in court yesterday was that look. There may be a case out there right now that says this under the Mississippi Constitution, abortion is a is a constitutional right, but it's not going to be that way for long. Roe has been overturned. When this gets up to the Mississippi Supreme Court, it's very unlikely that they are going to continue to uphold that Fordyce case. So because Roe has fallen, which was really the, the basis, the main basis of that Fordyce case, Fordyce is going to fall as well. And because we we are pretty sure it's going to fall, you should not be issuing a preliminary injunction that prevents the state from enforcing its laws in the meantime until the Mississippi Supreme Court clarifies that. Right. And as, as I recall, uh, in my uh, very rudimentary legal experience and knowledge just as a business person, there are certain standards that have to be met Absolutely. Uh, in order for a judge to, to rule that an injunction uh, should be. Absolutely. Ruled, right? So this is what was they're seeking here, what's called a preliminary injunction, which again means we haven't litigated this all the way, Judge, but while we're litigating it, don't let this the defendant right. do this or don't let this law go into effect while we're litigating it. And in order to get that, the main thing, you got to get four things, but the main thing you need to pl- prove is the plaintiff. And I do this all the time in my cases, too. I attempt to, to prove these things. You try to prove that, number one, you are likely to prevail as the plaintiff. So you're saying, Judge, when this does get to the Mississippi Supreme Court, we're probably going to win. Yeah. So the, the judge kind of has to almost semi-litigate the case or almost semi-decide the case, kind of predict the outcome of the case. Yeah. And then you have to show that you're, you're going to suffer irreparable harm if, if an injunction is not granted in the meantime. Then you have to show that the harm you're going to suffer outweighs the harm the defendant, or in this case, the state would suffer under the preliminary injunction. Kind of here it would be the state's lack of an ability to enforce its own laws. And then lastly, you have to show that a preliminary injunction would be in the public interest. Yeah. And so here the chancellor looked at all that and said, number one, you're not likely to prevail, Pink House. You're likely to lose. I don't think the Mississippi Supreme Court is going to continue to uphold Fort, Fort Ice, which I think is the correct uh, 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 prediction there. Mm-hmm. Number two, yes, uh, the doctor, the clinic will suffer irreparable harm, um, uh, you know, because, you know, you're not going to be able to, you're going to have to shut your clinic down. And, and a lot of things are going to happen to, you know, your patients, which you can portray as, as, a, as a harm to them or your doctors and all that. Um, number three, I don't think the harm does outweigh the harm to the state if it's not allowed to enforce its laws in the meantime. And number four, that it's not in the public interest right. because the state has an interest in enforcing this law. So it's it, it, even in uh, more straightforward cases, it's a very difficult standard. Yeah, it is. It is. It, I mean, intentionally, it is. You don't. I mean, if you're going to try to stop the state, you know, from from enforcing a law during the pendency of the lawsuit. You know, you need to have a very good reason to do that and and be able to show the judge. Again, the main thing that you show is that you're likely to win. Yeah.
Let's continue this discussion on the other side of the yeah, break. Sounds good. good. Yeah. Right. We got Aaron Rice from the Mississippi Justice Institute in the Element Wealth Studio. Foreigner bumping us into this segment in the Element Wealth Studios. We've got Aaron Rice, the director of the Mississippi Justice Institute. So as it stands right now, we're just talking about uh, the trigger law. Yeah. It goes into effect tomorrow. It does. It does, in fact, go into effect tomorrow. And again, the the in this lawsuit that we were just talking about, if the chancellor had granted the preliminary injunction, what we would have is a situation in which, you know, the Mississippi legislature seven years ago had passed and the governor had signed a trigger law that said if Roe is ever overturned, this is going to be the law of the land in Mississippi, yeah. and then Roe was overturned. But then, you know, because of a state constitutional, a 1998 state constitutional decision, that uh, law was was temporarily stopped from going into effect until the Mississippi Supreme Court could decide, you know, what the status of, of the state constitutional right was. That's what you would have had. And in fact, you know, I would not have been surprised if the chancellor had granted the preliminary injunction. And I'm not saying that the chancellor should have, but you could easily see uh, a trial court chancellor saying, look, as things stand, this Fordyce opinion is good law, you know, and so I'm just going to go with that and let the Mississippi Supreme Court clear it up. But again, I said this earlier, it's such a gray area here. It's such a kind of unusual case because you've got, yes, technically it's the law of the land right now, that Mississippi Supreme Court 1998 Fordyce opinion. Yeah. But it is, again, if you read the opinion and lawyers who might have read the opinion will know what I'm talking about, it was, it was, it really was based very heavily on Roe. And so anybody who's doing this chancellor doing what she's supposed to do, the special chancellor, and predicting kind of who's likely to prevail, I think it's, I, I, I think she made the right decision that, in fact, the pink house is unlikely to prevail here okay. at the end of the day. It, may, it makes sense. Yeah. And, and that uh, that seems like that once that box couldn't be checked, yeah. uh, that that pretty much ended it. Because the I, other yeah. standards are almost, yeah, they, they, they don't are, really I think, apply. Exactly. I think the, the, the main one really is who's likely to win here. Because if you can't show you're likely to win, then why should you get a preliminary yeah. injunction? Yeah. And so, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, so now, you know, it, the law will be in effect and the lawsuit will continue to work its way up to the Mississippi Supreme Court. But another twist you could have in the story is that it could maybe never even get resolved by the Mississippi Supreme Court because technically the legislature could start the process of enacting a constitutional amendment to clarify that, no, there is not a you know right to an abortion under the Mississippi Constitution. Yeah. Because what you had in 1998 was the Mississippi Supreme Court, you know, finding that there was a right that was not explicitly enumerated in the Constitution. And you could have the people come back and say, no, that is not the case. We're amending the Constitution to make clear that there is not a right to an abortion. Here's a question. So what happens if the clinic just defies the law yeah. and continues to provide abortion? Severe criminal penalties is what happens. So so the, the trigger law that is going into effect uh, makes it illegal for any person other than the mother to perform or assist in the performance of an abortion and can carry criminal penalties of a year up to 10 years in jail and fines and all of that. And so because the law is in effect, whether it later is overturned or not, right now it's in effect. So if somebody goes out, and again, those criminal penalties do not apply to the mother, but uh, to any you know to anybody else who performs an abortion during that period of time, the law is in effect. And, and so, you know, there would be criminal penalties. I mean, like... Did that. Literally, if it's suspected or reported, uh, does law enforcement enter the facility with a warrant or something? Oh, yeah, Is that yeah. how that works? It, it, I think it would unfold just like any other criminal, you know, act in the state. Yeah. Okay. So, and I'm I don't know exactly. You know, we have haven't been in this, yeah. this oh, situation before. <laughs> but yeah, I think it would be. You know, it could be anything from somebody swearing out an affidavit and saying. Uh, you know, this is this is happening in this clinic and it's illegal and, you know, law enforcement getting a warrant and going in to to find out. I think it would happen just like any other criminal, you know, act. Uh, it would be investigated and, yeah, arrests could be made and, and you know, court cases and all of that. Well, uh, it just we haven't had this. I mean, we're in uncharted yeah. territory, yeah. as they yeah. say here. But there, there have been reports in other areas of the countries where clinics that do provide abortion services are saying, yeah, we're just going to defy it and keep doing it. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I, I would, <laughs> if I were their attorney, I would not, you know, I don't know the laws in those states yeah. where the criminal penalties are associated with it like they are here in Mississippi, but I do think it would be a very dangerous uh, thing for any medical professional to be, sure. to be uh, 
trying to test the boundaries of the law, but particularly in Mississippi, like I said, I, I I know there are criminal penalties here, and so that would and and now we also have a court has declined to grant a preliminary injunction. So everybody knows that this law is in effect starting tomorrow. Wow, it's interesting. Uh, so we, I mean, possibly, we hope there's not any incident. Yeah, but it's kind of setting up. That yeah, we might. I, you know, I, I, I doubt there would be some kind of big showdown over this. I think most medical professionals, you know, you and I have discussed this. This is abortion is going to be legal in other states. Sure. I, I think what you're going to see is anybody who feels that passionately and strongly that they want to be providing abortions or supporting the the, the, the provision of abortions is going to go set up in states where it's legal and and try to attract people to travel to that state. To, to I don't think most. Most people are doctors or medical professionals would risk their license, risk their liberty, gotcha. all of that to violate the state law. So, um, but it has been interesting, you know, um, uh, and you and I discussed this too. I mean, a lot of the misinformation I've seen around, you know, what these laws, the trigger law in Mississippi, uh, you know, means and what they mean in other states. I've seen a lot of talk about, oh, this is going to prevent, you know, uh, miscarriage services. If, if you're, if you're if the baby in the womb doesn't make it and you have to have what's technically an abortion to remove the baby that that would be illegal that's not the case under mississippi's trigger law or any state's trigger law eptotic pregnancies if you've seen those uh or talk about that 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 would be illegal to treat that that i mean that's again mississippi's law says uh you know you can do it to to save the life of the mother right well i mean those kind of pregnancies are are a risk to the mother's life you can't just leave that sure so you know, there's been a lot, I think, of just misinformation about what these laws mean, both in Mississippi Seems and like outside. It. Yeah, I mean, it's it's almost as if the the prospect of defiance by the clinics is more to make a political statement. Yeah, than it yeah, is anything. Yeah, else, and so. I and I think too. I mean, I think they're going down swinging here. You know, is is, yeah. you know, I mean, I think they know that this uh, lawsuit, based on the old Fordyce opinion, is really a low probability, particularly with the makeup of the current Mississippi Supreme Court. So, I mean. If you're again, if you're predicting, and not not that the chancellor was necessarily tasked with doing this, but as a court observer looking in, you know that old Fordyce opinion read very much like the old Roe decision, and it was, okay. uh, you know, oh uh, well, there's certain penumbras of rights that aren't mentioned in the Constitution, but are nevertheless there. And, and again, you and I have talked about this too. There <laughs> are such things as unenumerated rights. No, no beef with that, and yeah. we want that. But if you're going to claim that something is, is an unenumerated right, a right that exists but isn't listed in the Constitution, you need to be able to show that there's a long history and tradition of that right being rooted in the American experience, experience or here, in this case, the Mississippi experience. Yeah. And that would go back to English common law and all kind of things. And you really couldn't do that here. And so, you know, that, but that decision, again, was, was very – it was not what you would call an originalist or textualist approach. It was very much – we care about the policy and we're going to force a way to get this policy that we want through the courts. And so even just as a pragmatic matter, I would find it very unlikely that the current Mississippi Supreme Court would ever write an opinion that looked anything like that 1998 Fordyce opinion. You know, the judges that are that are on the court now are going to say, let's look at the Mississippi Constitution. Let's read the words. What do they mean? Let's look at the history in Mississippi. In fact, again, abortion was illegal you know, in Mississippi at the time, that at least post quickening, and it's hard to say that that something is a right when it's illegal under certain circumstances. Yeah, you know, exactly. So. so you've seen a number of companies have announced that they intend to to uh, update their their policies, their their health benefits policies yeah. to uh, cover not only abortions, but travel mm-hmm. from a state where they are not allowed for their employees that live in those states yep. to states where they are allowed, might they be breaking any sort of laws or at risk of doing so if they, yeah. if that's for a, a, a person in a state, an employee in a state? Yeah, I think you could see that. I, it would depend on what certain state laws said. Yeah. And I don't believe that would, uh, under Mississippi's current trigger law, that would happen. And so I, what I do think is going to happen is this, is that I think we're going to see an escalation of this fight on both sides, the pro-life side, the, the you know, pro-choice, pro-abortion side, are both going to seek to kind of be at war with each other. So you're going to see, you could see uh, states start banning travel, or you could you could see California saying, we're not going to allow any state employee or, you know, to or agencies to do any business in Mississippi because we don't like their abortion policy. Right. But likewise, you could see Mississippi say, uh, or other states say, um, it's going to be a crime to assist 
in an abortion, even by funding it. Right. And I, th- again, that's not the case right now, I don't believe. But you're gonna you're gonna have th- a lot of that's gonna have to percolate through the system and figure out what exactly is illegal under various state Agreed. laws and what's not. Yeah. You got to go? You want to hang around? No, I can hang around. Yeah, we got Aaron Rice will come out. I want to get to some other topics. We we have a great discussion yep. about this one, and it's very timely and pertinent. But there's some other stuff we can talk about as well. We got Sounds Aaron good. Rice, the director of the Mississippi Justice Institute. We need to talk about the con laws again. Yeah, we'll for back. sure. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back. Studios, Aaron Rice, the director of the Mississippi Justice Institute. So we clearly haven't seen the end of what I think will be a flurry of lawsuits. Do you not? I, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So I think we are going to, I, we were talking about it kind of going into this break, but I, I think that this post row landscape is going to be very litigious for a very long time and not just litigious, but um, state legislatures, you know, kind of, I, I mentioned kind of warring with each other. And so I, I think it's going to take a very long time to really settle into what's the new landscape and what does it really look like. So, but I mentioned this, I mean, I think, um, as you alluded to, I think you could see some states maybe try to ban travel to another state and say you yeah. can't go to another state to get an abortion. Now, um, Justice Kavanaugh addressed that in his concurrence and said, look, I, d- I don't think that would pass constitutional muster. There's a right to travel. So sure. I, don't, I don't think states are going to be able to stop you from doing that. I think he did that because he knows he was kind of showing that that um, we would have the votes on the Supreme Court to stop that. So states don't even try, I think, is the okay. message he was trying to send. But that was there was talk of that um, before the Kavanaugh concurrence uh, in the Dobbs case. I don't know if I, I, I I'm sure we could see that. So you could see some states say we're going to ban traveling to another state for an abortion. Again, you could see states like California saying we're going to ban, you know, doing business with states. That, well, they've that already ban- they've already announced they're banning travel. Yeah. Uh, like state states. travel. Yeah. States. Yeah. yeah they, we're not going to spend any state money. Right. And we've seen that over kind of the bathroom wars. That's and stuff been like in that. place with voting rights. Voting as well. rights. Yeah. Bathroom bathroom fights yeah. in the past. We've seen this. So I think you'll see that again. Um, but I think you're going to see states try various mechanisms to do what's what I would refer to as extraterritorial enforcement of state law. Gotcha. So, you know, hmm. Alabama trying to enforce its state law in California, which I frankly don't think is a good uh, a good situation for states to get into that. But I think it's going to a, a lot of people are, are not going to be able to resist the temptation to try to do that. You and I have talked about the importance of federalism. Sure. And, you know. Whether we agree with another state's policy or not, I think that we need to we need to understand that this is the way America works, and that you know Mississippi has the right to to make its laws that govern its people, and sure. California has the right to make its laws. It's the way so we want it. It is it's the way, way it was designed. It, it, it is the way we want it. And as as you know, when it comes to abortion, you know it's a very contentious issue. Yes. Emotions are very high, and I, I think again, I think that we're going to see that. I think we're also going to see efforts on both sides to pass a, a, a federal ban or a federal codifying of Roe. So you're going to see people trying to get Congress to either make abortion legal in all 50 states signed by the president or Congress to ban abortion in all 50 states signed by a different president. And, I, you know, one good thing I could see coming out of that is I, I could see, you know, if Congress did that, the, the, the constitutional power it would be relying on would be the Commerce Clause power. Right. And you and I have talked about this when it was a vaccine mandate. The Mississippi Justice Institute helped litigate uh, with the Attorney General's office. We helped file a lawsuit against the Biden administration's OSHA vaccine mandate, and we argued they didn't have the power under the Commerce Clause. And I think you would see here, uh, you know, that the, the court is starting to put more limits on the Commerce Clause. And frankly, I think even liberal justices might be more inclined to start putting more teeth into limits on the Commerce Clause, because I could see either case say that uh, that Democrats were successful in codifying uh, Roe and saying abortion is legal in all 50 states. I could see the Supreme Court striking that down and saying you don't have the power under the Commerce Clause to do that. There's a state issue. But frankly, even if it went the other way, if if state if Republican Congress you know, Congress people and, and senators were successful in passing a ban on abortion. I think, you know, the, the Supreme Court would do the same thing. And I think the liberal justices would be with the majority on that and saying you don't have the power under the po- Commerce Clause to do that. So that's one good thing we could see come out of it is, is you know, put more teeth into the Commerce Clause. But all that to say, I think you're going to see fights at the federal level. You're going to see fights between the states. 
and it's going to take a long time for us to really settle out and see what are the laws in the various states and how do they interact with each other and what happened at the federal level. Uh, you know, the, the codifying uh, Roe v. Wade is, is not a, a legal cinch. It's not a, yep. a, a, um, a legislative cinch, for sure. There are yep. lots of issues there, and those who want to, it's not just, hey, we just want to write a law that says that you have a right to an abortion. It's, it's more than that. It's got, it's got to rely on certain aspects of existing law, in particular the Constitution. So they're looking at the Ninth Amendment, the Fourteenth yes. Amendment. And, 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 the, and the Commerce Clause, again, because people forget this. You and I have talked about this before. I mean, the, the federal government is a limited government. Right. And it's set out that way in the Constitution. And, and, the, and it says, the Constitution says, that for the federal government to do anything, it has to be able to point to a power in the U.S. Constitution that it has, that it, where the Constitution gives it the power to do that. Now, the states, by contrast, do not have to do that. State governments have plenary authority is what it's called. And okay. they can say, we don't have to point to anything in the U.S. or Mississippi Constitution to show that we have the power to act here. We have inherent what's called police power, the, the ability to pass laws for the health, safety, welfare, and morals of our people. And the federal government cannot do that. And so... Here, what the federal government would have to do is point to the Commerce Clause, which if you look at the Commerce Clause, it was originally designed at the time of the U.S. Constitution was, was adopted to prevent the states from getting into trade wars with each right. other. We had been under the Articles of Confederation. That hadn't really worked out. You had had a lot of trade wars between the states. So the Commerce Clause was supposed to say Congress has the ability to regulate interstate commerce to prevent kind of trade barriers, trade restrictions between the states. That's what it was intended for. So to carry that over and say that Somehow that grants the federal government the right to regulate for all 50 states on a, on a topic of health and safety and welfare and morals is really a stretch. Stretch at best. It is. Now, the problem is that this is one of the reasons we've seen the federal government grow just as horrendously as it has and getting out of all proportion to what it was intended to be under the U.S. Constitution is that uh, the U.S. Supreme Court has stretched the Commerce Clause for decades and decades and decades and said, well, this is okay, too much. This is okay, this is okay, this is okay. So we're getting to a point where there's got to be some hard limits on it. Now, actually, under the Obamacare decision, if you remember that, that put some limits on it. This vaccine mandate case that the Mississippi Justice Institute was a part of put some more limits on the Commerce Clause. So we're starting to see that it hit its outer limits and hopefully start getting pushed back the other direction. It's it's the catch-all is what's really happened. Absolutely. It was used as a kind of backdoor to be able to allow the federal government to do things that it was never intended to do. And so let's be clear, you'd have to have either 60 votes in the Senate or a filibuster-proof Senate to to do, uh, to codify. Yes. And, and, Aaron, if they did, it's back in the Supreme Court. No, yeah, it absolutely would be challenged into the Supreme Court. And, you know, on the on the topic of the filibuster, too, I think, you know, we talked about abortion being a very contentious issue. But I, I think you're seeing calls on the Democrat side to get rid of the filibuster. Now, you know, if you remember, they already did that when it came to judicial yeah. nominations way back we in the day. We talked about it. Absolutely. Harry Reid. Yes. And then and then when Republicans took over, Mitch McConnell had warned them and said, he if said, you do it, we're going to expand that to include Supreme Court nominations, and too. And they did. And, which and led Trump to the, got his it, Supreme exactly. Court judges, which, le- exactly. It, it led to the court we have now that, that Democrats are so upset about. So I think everybody needs to take a step back and say, we don't need to start changing the way our institutions no function. We don't need a court pack. We don't need to get rid of the filibuster. You know, let's just take a breath and try to try to govern on, with the existing institutions we no have, but it's, it. it's hard for people to do that on yeah. this topic. I, I agree, but uh, we hadn't seen or heard nor heard the last of this. All right, give, us, give me a quick update on uh, your case. Yeah, we were the, talking about the certificate yeah. of need case. Yeah. yeah, it's, it's you know, you and I have talked about this before, too. There's a lengthy period after you get past the motion to dismiss of, you know, just, just discovery is what it's called, where you retain expert witnesses, you work with them, you you, you exchange reports with each other, yeah. and then you start deposing witnesses and all of that. And so we're, we're in that phase. It's going to be a good while. I'd tell you that it's probably going to be a year before we have a trial wow. court opinion. Okay. Um, and then, and, you know, in the meantime, you know, we already talked about preliminary injunctions at the beginning of this as it came to, when it came to abortion. You know, we are not seeking a preliminary injunction in this case for various reasons. And so while we're litigating, the con law is, is still in effect. And of course, our client is not allowed to go out and help Mississippians with his, you know, home health service right. that he wants to start. Uh, that would be a great boon. I mean, it, especially to people in Jackson where he's trying to do this, to have another home health operator would be great for them. But he can't do that under the current law. And so right now we're, we're continuing to just 
march forward with the case, press forward with the case, you know, marshal our evidence and get ready to do all of that. And at some point we will, you know, either have a trial or something similar to a trial, kind of a trial on paper is what you could envision it as. And, and you know, hopefully the, uh, the, the judge in the case would side with us. You know, I honestly think we'll probably see appeals there too. You never know, but we could see appeals there too. So the fight will probably go on for a good while. As it stands, mm. the con law in Mississippi is on the books, and, and we're continuing our legal challenge trying to, trying to change that in well, Mississippi. Well, we're, we're wishing you luck with Absolutely. it. You know how I have strong feelings about uh, that interfering with the market. Yeah. You just can't get on board yeah, with it. Yeah, you've been a great advocate, Just and, and that's one thing that needs to happen too is that you know we're marching through the courts we're, we're trying to do what we can there but our legislators need to understand the the bad impacts of this the citizens totally of mississippi agree. need to understand so I'm, I'm glad to have other voices doing the same thing appreciate your work on that and appreciate you coming in today yeah, very, sure very informative always uh, a uh, interesting and and a good discussion appreciate yeah, it appreciate it jordan aaron rice the director of the mississippi justice institute has been in the 